Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our Perspectives on Justice in the Chauvin Murder Trial. My name is Sarah Davis, and I'm honored to serve as the Executive Director of the Legal Rights Center. Thank you for joining us for this critical ongoing community conversation on justice in the context of this trial. The Legal Rights Center is a community nonprofit law firm in Minneapolis founded in 1970 by the Black and Native American communities in Hennepin County and later joined by immigrant communities. LRC continues to be led and operated as a community driven organization and it is our mission to work with our communities to seek justice and promote racial equity for those to whom it has been historically denied. Today's forum is a part of our ongoing work focused on being responsive to community legal needs. We're now reaching the end of Derek Chauvin's trial for the murder of George Floyd. He's been found guilty on all counts. The trial is over and he faces sentencing in June. This forum is just one in a series of events and educational resources that LRC has continued to support over the past months. Please check out our website to access our educational videos, learn more about Q and A's with our attorneys and restorative processing spaces. It is now my honor to introduce you to our panelists for this evening. Joining us uh, again is Nakima Levy Armstrong. She's a civil rights attorney, activist, a national expert on racial justice, former law professor, and a legal scholar. Nakima is the executive director of the Wayfounder Foundation, which provides support for women of color activists and organize organizers around the country. She is also the founder of the Racial Justice Network, a grassroots organization that organizes and leads protests and demonstrations, provides community outreach and resources, and challenges injustices within systems that impact Black people and other people of color in Minneapolis and the Twin Cities. Tonight, we're lucky to be joined as well by Janelle Austin. She's the creator of Racial Ju Agency Initiative, a racial justice leadership coaching company. She is also the lead caretaker of the George Floyd Global Memorial, where she guides a team of volunteers to stand in the unique space of preservation and protest. She began tending to the memorial during the first week of the protest as a form of social resistance and self-care. Every day the memorial looked different and every day she and others would tend to both the new and old offerings so that the story could be preserved. Janelle earned a BA in Christian Ministries from Messiah College and a Master's in Divinity and Ethics and a Master's in Intercultural Studies from Fuller Theological Seminary. She consults and speaks nationwide on various topics as they intersect with race in America. She's a native resident of Minneapolis. She grew up blocks away from the intersection of 38th and Chicago in the Bryant neighborhood and joyfully serves the community alongside brothers and sisters in the ongoing fight for racial justice. We're also joined again by Mary Moriarty. She's the former Chief Hennepin County Public Defender, a role she served in for six years. She's also a core faculty member of Gideon's Promise for 15 years and the 2015 recipient of the Stephen Bright Award. She's on the faculty of Public Defender Trial Skills Programs in states across the nation. She teaches at Harvard Law School Trial Advocacy Workshop and the National Criminal Defense College. And she runs here in, in Minneapolis, the Criminal Defense Clinic at the University of Minnesota. Andrew Gordon is LRC's Deputy Director for Community Legal Services. Andrew was born and raised in Kingston, Jamaica. While he was in college, his cousin had a number of interactions with the police that ultimately led to his imprisonment for 10 years. That experience with the criminal legal system led Andrew to law school and to a career focused on representing those like his cousin who were disempowered and marginalized by a legal system designed to work against them. We're very lucky to have Andrew on our team at the Legal Rights Center. And now we are going to uh, jump right into our panel. Um, thank you all again so much for being here with us tonight. I uh, wanna start with the verdict. Um, we now have a verdict guilty on all three counts. I wonder if you all could just share with us where were you when the verdict was announced? Uh, what did you feel then and what have you felt since? Nakima, do you wanna get us started? Sure. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be a part of this esteemed panel. Um, <clears throat> since the excuse me, since the verdict happened, um, I no longer have to um, eat tums <laughs> on a regular basis. <laughs> That's the honest truth. I mean, it really caused a lot of um, Lord health issues. I would say from the stress and anxiety surround, surrounding the trial. And I think that that's important for people to hear because they see me as a frontline activist and so many other uh, black women and men and people never realize the toll that 
this type of situation can take, trying to hold it down for our community and then also trusting the outcome to uh, 12 people that we don't know. So I was um, about to be uh, in uh, interviewed by uh, Gail King at the time of the verdict. I was in a room with uh, women of color in media and we all wept and breathed a sigh of relief once the verdict actually um, was announced. And um, like I said, my stomach suddenly feels better. I can sleep better. I can eat more regularly than I did before the verdict. And I know um, a lot of other black people feel the same way. Andrew or Janelle or Mary, please jump yeah, in. Yeah, sure, I'll jump in. Um, so I was um, actually at the, the Hilton with um, Ms. Angela Harrelson, uh, George Floyd's aunt and Ms. Paris Stevens, George Floyd's uh, cousin. Um, with they had a room specially reserved for the family um, to receive the verdict and um, that morning I had I had gone to the square to be able to calm my nerves I did caretaking I was I was literally like sweeping streets and wanting to avoid people because I was just like I, I needed to be able to calm my own body but I was extremely nervous and um, when like the verdict came in, like I just began to weep. Like I just, and then I remember like we, we, we had that moment and then there was a press conference. And then um, I remember just feeling like I just need to be at the square. I need to be with my people. Um, and so I got to the square, uh, George Floyd Square. Um, as, as soon as I could, 38th in Chicago. And it just like the energy of just being around my community, um, finding the people who we've been protesting side by side with for 11 months um, and just embracing them and um, celebrating a win that I truly believe is, uh, is a win for the people and by the people. Um, I just, I don't think that if Minneapolis hadn't protested the way in which Minneapolis did and really woke up the world, um, that this trial um, would have gotten the attention that it needed to be, uh, to have a just outcome, to have the outcome that it did. And so um, it was a privilege and an honor uh, just to be among the people of Minneapolis um, and hold space uh, at 38th in Chicago um, after after the verdict came through. So, um, but Nakima, I feel you on those nerves and the stress that it weighs on the body. Yes, ma'am. You 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 are very um, on point with that with that truth. So, I was uh, right across the street from the government center at the Capella Building, and I was hanging out with. Uh, journalists from NBC and MSNBC. And as soon as they heard the verdict, they all disappeared. And I was kind of by myself in the building. And I started getting texts um, from Black friends saying, I feel sick. Um, I, I can't. I just feel awful about this. And I remember I, I expected the verdict to be back Tuesday afternoon, actually. And I was almost sure that it was going to be guilty, but I remember feeling, oh, I, I just want this so badly. Um, and I had been so busy throughout the trial, just talking about it to people, tweeting that kind of thing. Um, I just didn't allow myself to feel kind of the gravity of the situation. And so I heard the verdict and, um, you know, a couple of minutes after that, I had to be giving interviews or something, but I just started to cry. I put my head on the table and I just started crying. I was so emotional about it, so relieved, so I don't know what, it was like grief almost. Um, and then I had to be, I remember I, like I was on, I waiting for a hit on MSNBC. So I had a headphone here and I was on NPR and I was listening here. And I remember hearing horns honking 
and people cheering. And I remember thinking, oh, I just don't want to be doing this. I would just want to be outside with people. I want to be with people. I want to feel what people are feeling. I eventually got to do that and walking out of the building towards my car. I walked by the government center there in the grassy area and people were crying and um, happy. And there was a collective sense of relief. And it just felt good to be among people um, who really, really wanted this. Uh, evening all, I think it's my turn at this point. I, I, I think I shared a sentiment from Janelle, Nikim, and Mary. There was a certain level of relief. Um, it was really weird watching the, the verdict come back by a video because I've been in that courtroom. Um, I, I know Mary probably shares this as well, but you know, I've sat beside clients in that courtroom as we've gotten verdicts back. And so a lot of that stuff was going through my mind. Um, and, I, and I think like everyone else, there was a certain amount of relief. Uh, relief because, you know, the worst case scenario didn't happen. Um, relief because you had a number of jurors who saw, I, I guess, the world the same way that the bystanders saw the world and the rest of us saw it when we all watched the video. Um, and, you know, I, and I think this was a vindication, I think, not necessarily for the process, because I think there were issues with the process that we all see and that we're all still grappling with. But I think it certainly was vindication um, for those of us who put our faith in the jury at times and ask them to see what we're seeing and to respond like others have responded. And I think there was there was a certain there was certainly a vindication in that sense uh, and absolutely a sense of relief. Thank you all for sharing that with us. Um, you know, it was a particularly vulnerable time and just really appreciate your willingness to share this with all of us. You know, the, the verdict in this case was certainly the culmination of a lot of work over a long period of time. Um, Nakima and Andrew, I'm thinking back to when the initial charging decision came out and, you know, we were working on a joint letter about how, you know, legally insufficient that was and working with our partners at the ACLU to ask for um, the attorney general's office to be appointed or an outside counsel to be appointed. I wonder, you know, if we could talk just about some, what is the work, you know, Janelle mentioned this earlier, you know, this was the culmination of a lot of work to get to the place of this verdict. I wonder if you might all just comment on, on what that work has been to get to this point. Yeah, thank you for that um, reminder, Sarah. And I think that that's been part of our work even during the trial and in the aftermath, reminding people of the true narrative and that is the power of the people. You know, we know that the system did its part. I'm thankful for that stellar team of attorneys who stepped in to prosecute the case and their work validates all of the work that went into literally having to force the uh, governor to assign the attorney general to the case, demanding that Mike Freeman be removed from the case and, um, and also pushing them to increase the charges, right? So people see us going through that process now with regard to what happened to Dante Wright. It was a very similar process when uh, George Floyd was killed. And I know for me personally, as um, an activist, sometimes people forget that I'm also an attorney and because I'm so outspoken and assertive as an activist, they don't often wanna listen when I come forward from a legal perspective to say, the AG needs to handle this case. There needs to be higher charges in this case. And so I had to go get other attorneys like the Legal Rights Center, like the National Lawyers Guild, like the ACLU. I'm like, we gotta stand up and you guys did. You know, you helped to write a letter, you showed up at the governor's mansion which was huge. And we actually did like a teach-in. There were, I don't know, probably 500 to 1,000 people sitting outside the governor's mansion before the AG took over the case and before there were increased charges. And the governor actually came out of his mansion and he had to listen to us um, as legal advocates talk about why there needed to be um, second degree murder charges and why the AG's office needed to handle the case. So that didn't just happen because the system worked. That took us having to write letters, having to stand up, having to speak, having to go to the media, having to educate the public so they could help apply pressure in order for that to happen. 
and what it re and I'm thankful for you guys for stepping up and doing that because you could have moved on to other things that you had on your plates. But as lawyers and legal advocates, you step forward to lend your voices and your legal expertise. And then I wasn't alone, you know, as a, an activist and lawyer um, out there making these arguments. But I think um, the other thing that this reminds me of is that every decision point is important when we're looking at the process of trying to hold someone accountable. So think about if Darnella hadn't recorded that video and then um, someone hadn't tagged me to call the chief for the chief to know before too much time elapsed and on and on and on. And then people showing up at the first protest. And I mean, I just think about every decision point and how at any point we could have dropped the ball or trusted the system to work. And we know that that verdict wouldn't have been the same if that had happened. So I hope that this is a lesson in the importance of being vigilant and following your gut and knowing that you can make a difference as you step forward and you're relentless in the pursuit of justice. I was thinking about, and this cuts both ways, when it did get transferred to the attorney general, he assembled a team of what was it like 12 to 14 people, most of whom volunteered. Um, that is not the normal process. Um, and there were some things about the strategy that I know uh, upset people, but I, I, I think to myself, when, when people ask me, what does this mean for the future? I, I think on the one hand, it was critical that this verdict come back the way it did, but on the other hand, it's just a first step. And it's a very unusual case in that that team was assembled and that this conduct was very different than what we often see and we've continued to see, which is the shooting of somebody. Um, and, and for that reason, because we had nine and a half minutes uh, here, they got different instructions from the judge, uh, different instructions than the, the jury in Yanez uh, in, in the murder of Philando Castile. And so this was very unique uh, in many ways. And I think about what do we do going forward? I mean, the, the right thing happened here, but there are so many unusual things about this case. We have a lot of work to do um, to continue to move forward on accountability. Um, I'll, I'll jump in here real quick before Janelle, I think, wraps us up. But from, from my perspective, when you talk about the work that was done, um, I, I think the way I think about it and summarize it is that the, the community took control of the narrative, right? Um, there is a narrative that is usually thrown out there uh, when law enforcement murders somebody, especially murders uh, people of color, that people were allowed an opportunity here to ignore and to discredit. And that discredit happened, I think that discrediting happened almost immediately because as Nikim said, because of Darnella stepping forward with the video and getting that out there via social media. Um, it's funny, there, there was a, Libor Johnny wrote a Star Tribune article today about the BCA um, and kind of this, the, the early days of the investigation that they conducted. And in the article, um, Johnny talks about Bob Kroll, Chief Arredondo, senior leadership at MPD, other detectives, people from the mayor's office getting together at City Hall to talk about the case and to talk about this. Um, and that one, that struck me as unusual, but not so much in a case involving law enforcement and involving law enforcement use of force and violence and murder. And I can imagine what that meeting looked like in terms of thinking about how to construct a narrative. And I can draw a line directly from a meeting like that to the press release that was issued by Minneapolis Police Department uh, with respect to George Floyd's murder right after it happened, which basically said this man died of medical issues, right? And I, and I think where a lot of the work really paid off here is between people protesting, between activists and attorneys like Nikimo and Mary being out there and talking about the work and talking about the, the, the wrongness that we all felt. I think where that, that work really, really led to is we, we ignored that narrative. We ignored what they tried to do to George Floyd after his death, which is to paint him as the bad black man um, the scary black man who deserves what happened to him. Uh, and for that, we're all better off, right? 
Um, so that's that's where I see the work coming in, and that's where I see it really playing a significant contribution to the, to the result that we ultimately got. Um, I don't have much to add to those three responses, but like as a as a community member, as a protester, um, I just really want to second um, what has been acknowledged in terms of the work of the people and the work of um, protesters. Um, it, what, what has been phenomenal about this movement is that it's been intergenerational. If, if anybody has noticed this, it has been intergenerational in this protest. And for the first time, like I've been involved in many Black Lives Matter protests over the years. And I think for the first time, I felt my elders saying protest on and, and not saying sit down, baby. <laughs> like it's a, you, you've got enough exercise. But we're like, we're eight months in and they're like protest on. Um, and I think that there's something powerful to the community coming around um, each other and saying like, you know what, we are going to ensure um, that that this time that we are seen, that we are heard, um, and that um, accountability is done through the courts, um, and we are still we're still pursuing justice, right? Because I, I look at justice as the process of making things right. Things haven't been all made right yet. Um, we just got accountability through this through this court case, um, and so I think there's there is power when people rise up to the occasion. And, and um, I love what Nakima's uh, kind of motion and encourage folks to say like, you have a role, <laughs> like what does it look like to understand your role and live in and lean into that role in the moment? Um, and what I like to say is leverage your agency for, for justice, who are you? What, what talents do you naturally have? And how do you lean in uh, with those particular talents? Um, and so, I, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there so we can kind of continue with questions, but um, I just second what all the other um, uh, esteemed panelists have already said. Sarah, if I can just real quick pick up off what Janelle just said about the movement being intergenerational, it reminds me of the witnesses right, and how they came together from a nine-year-old all the way to an elder, Charles McMillan, and testifying about what they saw and how all their testimonies and their narratives came together to stand up and be the voice for George Floyd. That was really powerful, and I feel that that's how it was on the streets as well, with the different gifts and talents that people brought to the table to fight for accountability. And I even think about your story, Janelle, because you and I talked at length about this, how you were away at college and your mom said, you know, or you had moved away and your mom said, come home and help. And you became the caretaker of George Floyd Square, like a sacred space. That's, I feel one of the reasons that we can go there and pay tribute to George Floyd and other stolen lives because you personalized your role and your responsibility of being a caretaker and bringing love and strength and grace and perseverance into that space, along with other uh, black women and men. But you know, when I think of George Floyd Square, I think of you as that caretaker, as that person who was like tending a garden. You know, so that's just a key example of what you're saying about how you know how people use their agency in this movement and knowing that everybody has a role to play. Thank you so much. And you all don't have to ask for me. You can, this is a conversation. So please talk to each other. I appreciate it. But it's a perfect lead in because Janelle, the next question I was going to prompt here is, you know, for folks who maybe haven't, um, who are, are not, who are from out of town or just haven't been here, tell us about George Floyd Square and tell us about the work that it's taken to hold that space, right? Because that has not, that has not been an easy journey. No, no, it hasn't. Um, I think, so So, from my perspective, uh, like Nakima hinted to it a little bit, I was actually um, in Austin, Texas when George Floyd was lynched and um, following on my family group chat because my brother-in-law had texted Tuesday morning. He was like, this happened just right by your house. Um, and I had only watched uh, like till minute like four or five. Um, I didn't finish the video. When I, when I started to realize 
what this was going to. I like had flashbacks of Flando Castile and Alton Sterling videos. And I was like, I can't do this. I didn't even see the full video until the jury saw the full video. Um, and so I, um, I was actually offering like resources to my family from a distance and I was okay with that. Um, and then my mom was like, no, I just need you to come home. Um, and I said no at first because I was like, community organizers can get territorial and I don't want to navigate that stress. But she was like, no, I am asking you as your mother to come home. Um, and I, what, I, what I was hearing from my family is, was, if we're going to go through this, we want to go through this together as a family unit because this is heavy stuff. And by the time I came home, like I could see the trauma on my family's faces. Um, like the constant tears. I came home May 29th, so that Friday. Um, I just bought a one-way ticket. And um, when I had first visited the intersection 38th in Chicago, it was um, like people were saying, this is sacred space, this is sacred space. Now, as someone with the Masters of Divinity, like I'm like, cool, sacred space. Like <laughs> we understand that. <laughs> um, and so, um, but I, I started with protests uh, through marching on the street and I brought uh, a backpack. I actually checked one luggage and it was full of protest supplies. I knew TSA was watching me from the moment I stepped foot in the airport because my family has said stores are closed for like miles and so bring resources. And so I did like, uh, I just brought protest supplies and I hopped into the middle of a protest and just started handing out supplies to whoever needed whatever um, so that they could protest well um, and endure like things like calories, snacks, masks, gloves, uh, battery packs, like just the little things that people don't think about when they're in a moment of emotional energy. Um, but then I was in that protest on the highway that Sunday on the 31st where the truck was coming at us and it, it made me have flashbacks to the trauma that I had when I, um, I went to grad school in, in California and we had put our bodies in front of vehicles who were trying to ramp through uh, crowds of protesters. And so after that, I was like, I need to find another way to protest. And I chose caretaking. I, because I lived just a, a one minute walk away from the square, uh, every morning, I just committed myself to waking up at 6 a.m. I'm an early riser anyways, um, and just tending to the space. Um, and there were others, people who um, had relatives that were immunocompromised, and they couldn't come when the masses were there. But in the morning, it would be quiet, it would be still, and we could tend to the space and, um, and make sure that it was always cared for, because I knew that as long as the city saw that the space was being tended to, they couldn't make an excuse to say that it was being neglected and therefore it had to go. Um, but the ways in which the community was constantly coming together, I knew it was an important space to keep. So now 11 months down the line, what I can tell you is that the intersection of 38th and Chicago um, brings you five different things. And at any given moment, you could experience one or all of the five. And that is community, liberation, public grief, pilgrimage, and protest. Um, and it is a very unique space in that people have brought their full selves to those streets. Um, people have brought their, their grief, grief being processing loss. So you won't always find people weeping You'll, you may find that, but processing loss looks different for different people. Sometimes it's through art and celebration. Sometimes it's through contemplative prayer. Um, sometimes it's through asking questions. I have had random people come up to me. They look like, Yuri, look like you're supposed to be here. So I've got questions. Um, and, and if you know anything about um, the New Testament scriptures, there is a story of a man named Nicodemus who came to Jesus in the middle of the night and started asking questions. I have had those moments um, where I have had some like like white elders who would come and be like, "Okay, my children are protesting, and I don't understand why, and I've got some questions." And so, but that was important. Like that, that's them pilgriming to the space. That's them processing the loss that we've suffered as a collective, um, and then. 
I, I tell this one story for liberation because I think people um, have a lot of questions around how does this space bring liberation. There is this mother who came to me and she said, uh, Janelle, I was looking for my son and I couldn't find him. He's always attached to my hip because he has social anxiety issues. Um, we have him in therapy at school because he won't play with other children. Um, and I was frantically looking for my son because he wasn't at my hip. And then suddenly I looked up and there he was playing with your nieces and nephews. And she told me, she said, Janelle, you have to understand he doesn't play with other kids. And so that story has always stuck with me that here you have a child that can be liberated in a space in a way that is so profound that even his mother is confused about what is happening to my child. And so um, I think that as people come to the space, as we bring our grief, as we bring our questions, um, as we bring our protest, um, as we bring this kind of commitment to community, because we like to say at George Floyd Square that we're imagining a world beyond policing. Uh, we are leveraging community in such a way where we're taking back the outsourcing of that responsibility rather than saying, okay, we're just gonna hand it over to police. We're gonna actually look at what can we do as community members? How can we call upon each other? What other phone numbers can we call if there's a certain crisis um, that we can say, uh, we can start to build out what it actually means and looks like to be community. It has not been perfect. We haven't always gotten it right, but what we can say is that we've always shown up for each other um, and that we've always figured out. It took us three months to figure out angled parking instead of parallel parking. So that way everybody's car could fit. Like, and in the meantime, having arguments and trying to do um, a, a restorative justice process where there's disputes. And so it has not been easy. There's different personalities, different religions, um, different uh, age groups, different perspectives on the world, different socioeconomic status, different mental health capacities. Um, there is a lot of variety, different cultures. Um, there's a variety of people who come to George Floyd Square um, and we have to navigate that in the context of community. And it is hard work and it is deep work, but I can tell you that it's also rewarding work because it pushes us towards that vision of justice that we're trying to pursue. Um, and so, and I think that narrative has to go hand in hand with um, this trial because for people look at George Floyd Square and say, okay, justice is served, you're gonna open up the streets. And we were like, well, we actually never stated the conviction of all four officers uh, to be the sole outcome of justice. Uh, because justice, if injustice is systemic, so does justice have to be. Um, and so we're, we're really looking at how do we address a lot of the root causes and conditions that created the situation in the first place. And that is the process of making things right. Um, that is repairing the harm. That um, is to the, 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 the capacity of being able to lean into what we understand to be justice. The trial is accountability because when you kill somebody, when you murder somebody, you need to be held accountable. Um, and, and I love what uh, brother uh, Andrew Gordon had, had mentioned about trusting these 12 jurors to actually see what we saw. I never even thought about it that way, but yeah, that is kind of scary. Like here you have tens of thousands of people <laughs> who, who saw it a certain way and we have to rely on 12. Like, and, and, and that's hard to carry. Um, but, uh, that, but, this is, but this is who we are at George Floyd Square. And this is what we're trying to uphold. No, I so appreciate, I mean, the connection I want to draw between what you've shared around the space, right, and this public space, and thank you for all you've done to hold that space and, you know, caretake that space, and this idea of transformative, you know, how do we transform systems, transformative justice, 
um, you know, as you mentioned, in this case, we, you know, we now know, right, there's a guilty verdict on all counts for Derek Chauvin. And that is accountability, but many folks have said it's not justice, right? And so in, you know, in the context of this, I wonder if we could have a conversation amongst the panel of how do we move from individual accountability to systemic transformation and towards a place of systemic justice? You know, and I do just want to put out there in this case, um, you know, the state built a narrative that Derek Chauvin dishonored his badge, that he didn't represent the values of MPD. Um, they went so far as to call this a pro-police prosecution in their closing. And they built that narrative to secure the conviction for purposes of accountability. But how does that impact efforts to move towards this systemic transformation and towards this justice that we've talked about? And I wonder if the panel could talk about how do we shift from individual accountability to transform transformative systems change and justice? One thing I thought about is we heard a lot of testimony about the policies of MPD and the aspirations and the values and the training. Um, but we, people in the community, public defenders, a lot of us know that there's a huge gap between maybe the aspirations, the values, and what actually happens on a day to day basis. But now we know how their, what their policies are, how they're trained, what the expectations are. We need to force accountability. Um, be, because we see these interactions every day um, by the Derek Chauvins on the department that just don't reach the, the tragic level that they reached in the George Floyd case. And there has to be accountability for those actions uh, to prevent something like this from happening. And we're far away from that. Um, and in my mind, that requires the entire system and the community uh, to work on this. This isn't just a policing thing. This is a prosecution thing. Uh, this is a judge thing. Uh, this is a public defender thing. This is everybody in the system having to play a role to hold police and each other accountable for what happens to people in the system. So I, I understand the narrative that they created that gave them the best chance of, of getting accountability here. I use that as, okay, now we know what the aspiration is. We know what happens. What are we gonna do uh, to close that gap? Um, and, and, and we have a lot of work to go there. I think it, I was waiting on Andrew to join in. You want to say something, Andrew? Uh, sure. I, I, was, I was taking some notes, but I, I'll also, I'll, I'll be real quick here. Um, I, I think Mary is absolutely right, right? You're talking about systemic issues that involve a number of different individual and entities. We're not just talking about the police. We're talking about the courts, judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys, whether they're public defenders or not. Um, I think we're talking, if we're going to system, systemic justice, right? So, you know, when, when Janelle talks about um, justice has to be systemic as well. You know, when we talk about that and we apply it to the system and we apply it to decision makers who need to recognize at some point that the work they're doing is upholding an unjust system because that recognition needs to come at some point, whether it's because they're responding to protests you know, whether it's because Nakeem and other people are outside Pete Orpert's home and saying charge Kim Potter with second degree murder, right? That recognition has to come up at some point. It has to. Um, and, you know, it, it has to be more than, it has to be, it can't be performative, right? It can't be that politicians are showing up at Dante Wright's funeral and then a couple of days later authorizing who knows how much money to fund the police and law enforcement, the folks who were, tear gassing and shooting rubble bullets at the people who were protesting in honor of Dante Wright. Um, you know, it, it, so it, it can't be that. Uh, I, I think there has to be, it has to start with a recognition that the system itself is unjust, that the work that a lot of, a lot of us are doing on a day-to-day -day basis, basis is upholding white supremacy, it's upholding racism, uh, it's upholding harm to the community. And I think until we get that recognition, and you know, this is one thing why I think protest is so important, because protest, as it represents kind of voice of the community, is one way to inform people in power, people who have the power to make decisions, um, that their viewpoint, the things that they're doing is wrong. 
Uh, and, and I think that recognition is going to be incredibly important to us moving to the type of systemic justice that we all hope to achieve with the work that we're doing, whether it's at George Floyd Square, in courts, or wherever that may be. Just to piggyback off of what um, Andrew just said, I do believe that protest is important. And I think that um, one thing that's important for people to understand is that when we protest, it does help to apply pressure because we are disrupting people's comfort. We're disrupting business as usual. And we just saw this on Sunday when we went and held church service. And I noticed the media, when they covered the story, they put church service you know, in like quotation marks. I'm like, well, I'm an ordained reverend. We did have church. It just was outside the scope of where people normally think church should happen. But people heard sermons, praise and worship, prayer, we called on God and then what happened towards the end of the service, we saw exposure of extreme racism where we were called the N word. And then that was connected to someone who works inside of the system with vulnerable pop populations every day being exposed for their racism. And that led me, you know, earlier today, I had a conversation with the head of the Department of Corrections and talking about this situation and saying, how does someone work there who has so many offenses under their belt, but they're working with people who are incarcerated. How does that happen? That's an HR issue that has not been addressed that puts vulnerable populations in danger. So the more pressure we apply to the system, the more we expose the injustices and the things that have been able to fly beneath the radar screen. So um, I wanna encourage people continue finding ways to protest, whether people can take to the streets or show up somewhere or write, you know, people can use the power of the pen to write op-eds, to write blog posts, tweet. I mean, whatever is in your power, like Janelle said about using your agency, do it in order to protest. And I think if more lawyers put pressure on the system, we would begin to, to see change. But most lawyers are very comfortable with the status quo. That's why judges don't get challenged when they are upholding white supremacy and they are allowing people to be abused by the Minneapolis Police Department and other police departments, and they're not questioning it. They're taking an officer's word at face value, even with a history of untruthfulness or falsifying reports and things like that. And that makes it difficult when you do have a trial, when you know how the system functions and it unfortunately too often works against the side of justice. So I think more of us need to be accountable for our roles in the system, our comfort and our complacency, and to actually place demands on ourselves to do better um, and to challenge what's going on. I think that the other thing that this um, trial exposed, or at least the process getting up to the trial, exposed our lack of ability to trust in county attorneys to uh, stand up for what's right. I mean, we've been calling out Mike Freeman for years he is one of several metro area county attorneys who have protected killer cops. And there has been no accountability. And so that's why we're saying Governor Walz, instead of continuing to advocate for more money for law enforcement, instead of authorizing something like Operation Safety Net, which allowed abusive protesters, use your power to transform the system. At a minimum, create an office of the special prosecutor. So we don't have to keep lobbying you and Keith Ellison to take on these cases and to uphold um, what we want to see in terms of justice and accountability. That should be a no brainer. And all that money they just spent to reimburse law enforcement here and out of state, they could have put into developing an office of the special prosecutor that will take on these cases from the moment of investigation all the way to the end of a trial. Because we can't trust the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension we can't trust metro area attorneys. We can't trust the police to be honest. This was one situation where cops, for the most part, were willing to throw one, one bad apple away in order to protect a rotten system, right? You know, putting out that this is just one note. He was allowed to get away with how much before finally the world saw a public lynching. And he's one of many officers throughout the state of Minnesota who has similar records of abuse towards civilians and they're allowed to get away with it. So I hope people step up and, and really take seriously the importance of challenging the system. Otherwise, 
will be celebrating one guilty verdict and everything else will remain intact. Can I talk about, um, because I, I think the, obviously when, when people are, are killed by police, people know that, but the day-to-day -day stuff is really harmful. And just to give you an example, um, so this wasn't even the Minneapolis Police Department, it was a Corcoran police officer in Hennepin County who testified in six different cases in suppressor. Um, he searched people's cars and, and claimed to find drugs. Six judges, five different judges threw out six of his cases because he violated people's constitutional rights. And in two of those cases, judges found that he, in judge speak, lied. They would say he was not credible. And when the super, one of the supervisors in the county attorney's office was asked, what are you going to do about this cop? The answer was, we're not his employer. And I think people need to let that sink in. It is a total, in my mind, abdication of uh, a prosecutor's responsibility to hold cops accountable. And that's just one of the day-to-day -day things that happens. It's this, we want to get convictions. We, you know, they're, they don't work for us. Um, the fact that they violate people's constitutional rights or may lie on the stand is not for us to deal with. That is huge because if we had prosecutors who said, uh, you know, we're not going to prosecute your cases. I'm gonna pick up the phone and call the, the police chief and say, there's a problem here and you need to do something about it or we're not gonna prosecute these cases. There, there are so many roles that prosecutors can play in holding police accountable. And so I agree, Nakima, I, mean, I think it's a good idea um, to think about how to create a unit uh, in the AG's office or wherever that prosecutes uh, uh, cases where people are killed. But on a day-to-day -day basis, we need to have prosecutors and judges who are holding police accountable for the everyday behavior. Because when they get away with that, they think they can do anything. They can come into court, they can lie. There are no consequences or accountability. And that just continues to happen. Thank you for this incredible conversation. Um, We've had quite a few questions come in and there's some technical things we want to get to. But before we do that, Janelle, I want to come back to you because you got us started on this conversation about transformative justice. And I wonder if you could comment briefly about what it looks like to, um, you know, what does transformative justice look like in the context of public spaces and allowing public space for the type of memorial that we've seen develop um, in George Floyd Square? Yeah, so we came up with Justice Resolution 001 when the city wanted to reopen the streets last August. It's more commonly known as the 24 demands. And you may be driving around Minneapolis and see these signs, yellow signs that say no justice, no streets. Um, what had happened last summer when the city wanted to reopen the streets, um, uh, folks came together and said, wait a minute, like you're gonna reopen the streets and go back to business as usual. And as Nakima said, protests exist to signal that there's something wrong that needs to be addressed. Um, and so we simply told our council members, said, hey, like before y'all reopen the streets, we're gonna need to see some justice first. And so we actually went around asking people within our community that question of what does justice look like to you? And that was important because what it did was is it, it centered marginalized voices who would never get a seat with the mayor, who would never get an opportunity to sit at the table with council members or wouldn't be invited to sit at the table in, in private backyard meetings. But to be able to say, we see you as our community members and we wanna know what justice looks like to you. And so the um, Justice Resolution 001 had 24 points, which we identified as 24 demands because it showed that our community wasn't monolithic and that depending on what your uh, what your position was in the community, whether you were a business owner or a homeowner um, or a youth or um, just a, a protester um, in whatever capacity that looked like, or maybe you were part of a neighborhood organization or a nonprofit organization, what you need to see to 
um, have everything be restored looks different. And so this document really centers multiple voices, but then also looks at it in the looks at it in the context of this particular experience, this particular case, and also other cases. I saw someone's question in the chat about um, should other cases be open for investigation? That was actually one of the things that we had put on our 24 demands to say, we need to reopen investigations and take a second look at some of these cases um, that uh, have been ruled in favor of the officers. And so asking that even before uh, Derek Chauvin's trial to say that what, what we've seen and what we believe about the system that exists, we want uh, new investigations. Um, and we want um, oversight um, in such a way where it's not the same people doing the investigation over and over and over again. Um, the removal of, of Mike Freeman, that is something that the community uh, joined all of Minneapolis and Hennepin County, or uh, much of Minneapolis and Hennepin County and, and asking for Mike Freeman to be recalled. Um, because of his track record. And I think it was huge um, when the judge told him that his work was sloppy, I believe. Uh, that, was, that was in September. That was huge because finally somebody was acknowledging what we've been trying to say for a very, very, very long time. Um, and so I, I think justice for systemic justice for a community is going to range, but it has to include economic justice. Um, it has to include um, a kind of justice where it considers the most marginalized people when it thinks of what that includes housing um, and jobs. And uh, we like to say justice brings safety. So there are people who are like, oh my gosh, we need more police because that brings safety. We're like, no, like what does it look like for us to actually think of mental health and wellness as safety? Um, what does it look like uh, for us to actually consider accountability of police as safety um, and so or that protesters not be penalized for uh, using their first amendment right um, and so we are we're looking at like a holistic justice but it starts with centering what centering black voices first of all um, and second of all um, centering marginalized voices that often don't get a seat at the table um, and so i think these are important aspects when you're thinking about um, justice is not going to be one singular outcome. I like to say it's justice is not a, um, an outcome to a particular event. Justice is a way of life. So how do we design what we are looking for? If all the systemic oppression that we are experiencing is by design and by intent, how do we work together to design justice for our community where it's looking at long-term sustainable justice? And so we have to listen to folks first to see what they actually want and not tell them what they want and need. So appreciate you sharing that, Janelle. And I'm gonna tell you all now that before we end this panel, we're gonna come back to this question around what are some, what are the steps that people can take, right? We've had questions come in about that. What are things that you all support, transformations that are happening, steps that people can take? But before we go there, we've had um, several questions come in about the trial. Uh, we haven't been here in a panel since actually before closing. So we wanna answer some of the questions that are coming in about the, the legal aspects of the trial. Um, there were some questions about the jurors and whether they're allowed to reveal their identities um, before Judge Cahill does chooses to do that. Um, are they allowed to grant interviews or write books or things along those lines? I know we've seen an alternate juror um, do some of that already, but I wonder if one of our lawyers on the panel might jump in and answer some of those questions. Or you want to take that one? For um, yes, <laughs> they can. Um, so, so what the judge has done is uh, he's issued an order keeping their names anonymous for six months, at least six months, and he'll review that at six months. But it is completely up to the jurors to decide if they want to give interviews, if they want to write a book. Um, we, I know we've heard about the one alternate. I've also heard about a couple of other jurors who have spoken. They don't want to be known yet. Um, but that is totally up to them to decide whether they want to talk about what they experienced. Um, and I wonder then if we could talk just a little bit more talking about the trial, you know, the next step in this process, the 
you know, there's guilty verdicts, but could we talk about um, sentencing, which is coming up in June? And I know the date just got moved back a week. I think it's June 25th now. Um, and so, and inevitably that will be followed by an appeal. So what are you watching for? What should people expect from the sentencing hearing? I know there's a ton of misinformation out there about, um, you know, concurrent versus consecutive sentences and the statutory maximum. And I know a lot of us have been trying to put out information as it relates to that. So can we talk just a little bit about what you're watching for, what people should expect? You know, I did just to pitch the, the spokesman recorder, right? a column this week on all of those issues. Um, that's pretty straightforward. And if I had any ability whatsoever, I would put it in the chat. <laughs> um, but I did go through why it's there's no concurrent sentencing. And, and just in a nutshell, um, he will be sentenced on the top count, which is unintentional second degree murder. He will not be sentenced on the other two counts, uh, which is OK, um, because the top count is the most serious one. The, the government has asked for a sentence that's longer than what the Minnesota sentencing guidelines re, or allows. It has a range of 128 months to 180 months with the middle of the box, as we call it, being 150 months, which is what Noor got in his case. And so what's going to happen between now and the sentencing is that the lawyers are going to write memos to the judge to convince him or not that aggravating factors are present. There are five of them that the state has proposed. The judge will make that decision. He'll tell the lawyers and then the lawyers will write memos to the judge about what they think the appropriate sentence should be. I think that he's gonna get a longer sentence than Noor um, because if you compare Noor's conduct to Chauvin's, I think there are many more egregious factors in, in Chauvin. So I see him getting a greater sentence than 12 and a half years. There is a case that says with aggravating factors, the judge can do a, what's called a double departure from the top of the box um, and be safe from being reversed on appeal. And so th this is all made, you know, like just, you know, rolling the dice and guessing, but I thought he'd get a sentence in the ballpark of about 20 years, um, but probably more than 12 and a half and less than 30. Yeah, and, and what I'll jump in and add real quick, um, because I think Mary is absolutely right on all of that. Just from a process perspective, what people can expect to see at sentencing is that you're going to hear arguments from both the prosecution and the defense with respect to what they believe an appropriate sentence should be. And, and the conversation I've had with a number of people over the past week or so is don't be surprised when you hear Eric Nelson or see Eric Nelson get up and argue that Derek Chauvin should get a probationary sentence, right? Just don't be surprised that that's what's going to happen. Expect it. Um, you are likely going to learn a lot about um, I, I imagine you're going to hear Derek Chauvin actually say something at a sentencing hearing, uh, as opposed to what we've, we've gotten radio silence since then. But don't be surprised that you're going to hear an argument for a downward departure, so asking for probationary sentence or asking for less prison or jail time. Um, and don't be, surprised that, don't be surprised when we actually hear from Derek Chauvin. I'm looking forward to that particular aspect of it, because one of the things that we haven't heard from Really, I think anybody in MPD, to be perfectly honest with you, not, not even, I think, uh, Chief Arredondo, but I, I don't know that we've heard like an apology. I don't know that we've heard an admission of wrongdoing just yet. And it will be really interesting to see if at sentencing we get that from Derek Chauvin. Which raises a good question from a defense lawyer perspective. Um, the probation officer who's writing a report will also ask Chauvin if he wants to say anything. And the problem you get into if you have just been convicted at trial, yet you maintain your innocence and you're going to appeal, is that the judge is actually looking for you to show remorse and accept responsibility, except that if you feel you've done nothing wrong and you want to not jeopardize your appeal in any way, you don't want to acknowledge responsibility. Um, and, and so it's always kind of a strategic thing. And, and so it will be interesting to see if Chauvin says anything at the at his sentencing. I, we will hear, everybody should be prepared to hear what's called victim impact statements. 
those can be exceptionally hard to hear um, because they're grieving family members, uh, friends uh, who will get up, some of them get up in front of the judge and they talk about the impact George Floyd's death had on them. Um, and, and they can be very, very difficult to hear. One thing you could hear too, is that all of those people who choose to give victim impact will be told that they are only allowed to address the judge. They cannot address it to Chauvin. And sometimes people get emotional and turn to the person who's been convicted and the judge will kind of gently say, please address it to me. So it does have the potential of, of being very emotional just to prepare people um, if they are going to watch it, that, that there will be a very emotional component of it. Sarah, can I ask um, a question about how people felt about the, um, <laughs> the defense counsel bringing up the statements by Congresswoman Maxine Waters about getting more confrontational um, Judge Cahill's response to that um, regarding whether it can set Chauvin up, you know, when he asks for his uh, sentence to be overturned on appeal. Yeah, that, that was um, ridiculous, I thought. Um, and I, I got asked a lot of questions about that too. First of all, I don't see that playing any role in any appeal whatsoever. I, I see it being brought up as part of an appeal. But the odd, what I didn't like about it first, so the judge was very, very angry uh, at the city council making the announcement of the settlement in the middle of jury selection. And if you ask me what I thought was the most prejudicial thing that happened in the trial that's going to be talked about in the appeal, it was that settlement. However, I think Cahill did what the Court of Appeals would expect a judge to do by bringing the jurors they had back and questioning them and, and actually dismissed two of them um, and then did thorough questioning. But what I thought was really inappropriate about the comments in the courtroom was that um, this was the first time anybody was named. Uh, the judge specifically called her out by name and never said, never called anybody out by name, like the mayor, the city attorney, any council members that were at that, um, that announcement, that press conference. And it, it was, to me, it, it was kind of stunning. I, I, I'm sure he's exhausted, um, stressed, but you know, uh, Representative uh, Waters is a civil rights icon. She, she's been fighting for civil rights longer than many of us have been alive. And she flew here all the way from California to be with people uh, at the protest out in Brooklyn Center. And the one story I read was that she was talking to a young woman who was studying political science and said, was encouraging her to run for office. And when I read her comments, I read them as we have to continue to protest and we have to be confrontational about these policies and accountability. That's how I interpreted her comments. So. I thought that was offensive um, that she was brought up by name and that um, her, like the judge said her comments were abhorrent and that he would say that it might give uh, a new trial because that scares people. When judges say stuff like that, it scares people. Um, and so I, I was, I don't know what was up with the judge. I don't think it was appropriate at all. Um, I, I, took her comments to mean nothing more than we need to be confrontational about policy change. Um, and I don't think that that's going to play much of a role in an appeal. Thanks for bringing that up, Nakima. I wonder, um, Nakima or Janelle, you know, just circling back to this, this conversation about sentencing, uh, you know, we've heard a lot from Andrew and Mary about what we might expect, and I think there's a lot of technical aspects. Um, Andrew, thanks for dropping those links into the chat, and also Malika, who is running our tech behind the scenes, also helping out with that. But I wonder just if you can bring, uh, and Nakima also brings a legal perspective, but just also that community perspective around, you know, sentencing is 
you know, a month and a half or two months away, I guess, at this point. Um, you know, what are you thinking about? What are you watching um, within the context of what's been shared? Hold on. Oh, sorry. I was having some trouble unmuting myself. Well, I've noticed um, people commenting by saying, don't celebrate the verdict too soon because sentencing hasn't happened yet. So there are folks who are still holding their breath after hearing guilty, 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 because they're waiting to see what Judge Cahill will do. I think that if the sentence is too light, if it's anywhere in the realm of what Muhammad Noor received, there is going to be an outcry regarding injustice. The fact that this horrific murder happened in the presence of children, I hope that the judge takes into account as far as aggravating circumstances are concerned. The fact that Chauvin was a veteran, you know, he spent much more time on the force even than Muhammad Noor. And like Mary said, the facts of this case are even more egregious than that incident. And there's video, unlike there was in the um, Muhammad Noor case regarding what actually happened. So I am hoping that he gets as close to the maximum as possible, even though I know that it is a first offense. And even though I know that our system doesn't like holding police officers who kill people accountable. So I can't offer much comfort to people in the community who are still holding their breath. I think they have every reason and right to be skeptical about what could happen, but I'm really hoping that Judge Cahill does the right thing in light of the magnitude of this situation and the worldwide outcry for justice that resulted uh, from the murder of George Floyd. Absolutely, and I, um, I mean, I was hearing conversations about sentencing even before the trial started, just people, um, when we look at the black experience and how sentencing has worked against us and worked against our communities. Um, I think that is like one area where we also like need to see our, our system starting to turn to be actually more just. Um, and so if in this process, if the sentencing is too light, yeah, I agree with Akima, there's, there's gonna be an outcry. Um, and my, personal opinion, um, having studied like cultures around the world um, and historically and contemporary, there's, there's many cultures where if you kill somebody, the, the outcome is death. It's like life for a life. <laughs> um, that's not always the case here in the US. And um, so I look at this and I'm like, whatever sentencing he gets, it's gonna be uh, mercy. Um, and the question then is, will the sentencing be appropriate for not just taking the life of George Floyd, but literally taking life from community? Um, and, and a community experiencing a public lynching um, is traumatic and painful. But not only did we experience a, a public lynching, we also then experience the National Guard, the militarization of the police, the, uh, the helicopters flying over our heads, the, uh, um, the white supremacists and nationalists like rising up and, and terrorizing and traumatizing our communities. There was a whole series of events um, that, that came out and followed because of the actions of, of Derek Chauvin. And so I think it's important to, to put in perspective that a, a proper sentencing, a, even a heavy sentencing um, is just like, just the beginning of the first steps of providing some kind of relief to, um, to, the, to a black community. Um, and not just at 38th in Chicago, but I believe across the Twin Cities area, um, as we have gone through this, gone through this trauma uh, together. You know, I, you mentioned I teach a class at the university and most, many of the people in my class would describe themselves as abolitionist. 
And so I posed the question to them, what kind of sentence should Derek Chauvin get? Um, and it was an interesting conversation and it is an interesting sort of philosophical thing for me to think about too, as a defense lawyer who knows that uh, our, our black community gets sentenced much more harshly. Um, and, and when I look at these things, I want our clients to be treated like rich white people. I don't want it to be the other way around. But you know, most of the answers from my class when I said, well, okay, you don't believe in prisons, you're abolitionists, what, what do you think a sentence should be? And they all said, well, we'll have to start the abolition after Chauvin's sentence. <laughs> It's not fair to start with a white cop. After the other three, too. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, right. Yeah. Hey, there's so still I, three more, yes. Yeah, so I just, I wanted to throw out there just because I think it's so important to reform this system that has just uh, decimated many in the Black community, families, and sentences have been ridiculously long that we don't want to move towards you know, harshness for everybody. Um, we want to move the other way, but it, we're also understanding that, um, as my students said, we're, we're not going to start with Derek Chauvin. Um, but it is an interesting question to think about after he's sentenced. <laughs> right, but, but I think that to your, to your point though, those mm -hmm. sentences have been ridiculously long for offenses that that were minor compared to what Derek Chauvin did, right? Some so, of them have. So if he if he gets the, that 12 and a half to 13 years, and I know brothers who've gone to prison for 20 years mm -hmm. for just carrying some marijuana, like, oh, that's gonna enrage mm -hmm. um, so, some folks in the community, not just here in Minneapolis, but really across the country. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, yeah, the, the sentencing, justice and sentencing, I think it's an important conversation that we can need to continue to have in this country. Yeah, and I think what I'll, what I'll jump in and say real quick is that, because <laughs> I, I, I consider myself an abolitionist as well. And so I've had a lot, of, I've gone through a lot of the mental gymnastics that Mary just described with respect to how I think about this case. But what I've settled on, and I think this is true, is that the effect of imprisonment and incarceration on Derek Chauvin, like he will wear incarceration much different than some of the people that Mary and I have represented in our time working in the public defender space, right? He hit the treatment he will get while incarcerated is gonna be different than if we were black. Um, the prospects that he will have for when he gets out, because he will get out at some point, the prospects that he will have to kind of be welcomed back into the brotherhood of police officers, right? That incarceration is gonna change that. I, I, I don't know what his job prospects are gonna look like, but the, the, he has at this point, I think more to look forward to than the average black person walking into a jail or prison. And for me, it, it's difficult to talk about and to compare what Chauvin is gonna wear as a sentence versus somebody else because he, he walks into it with a certain level of privilege that I think a lot of people don't truly understand when they talk about going behind bars and talk about going to a prison and a jail. Um, and, and I think back to, and because you know, I've been doing long enough now where I remember like Amy Senso, right? When Amy Senso killed someone on 94W getting off on the ramp uh, and she went to prison for what, two and a half years, I think it was, right? how she wore incarceration and the effect it had on her life after she was released is very different than if she were a poor black woman, right? Um, and, and I think that has to be a part of this discussion when we're talking about what an appropriate sentence for Derek Chauvin looks like, because his experience of prison is gonna be very different than what a, a similar black person his, in his shoes would, be, would have. Um, Melissa Anderson just put in the chat that uh, Amy Sensor served about 14 months um, for what she did. And just along the lines of what you guys were talking about, remember Derek Chauvin almost was able to serve his time in federal prison. He was working out a deal with Mike Freeman and the federal government um, to plead to uh, third degree murder in exchange for 10 years in federal prison, which means he would have served less time than that. And it was only because of AG William Barr 
making a decision to not allow that, that that didn't happen. Um, I also think about the correctional officers and how they will likely treat Derek Chauvin as one of them potentially. Um, that whole you know situation that we just went through over the weekend involving a correctional officer in Washington County. Derek Chauvin lived in Oakdale, if I remember correctly, which is in Washington County. So the chances of them seeing him as one of them versus the way that they see the average black and brown prisoner um, are pretty high. So he is gonna get, unfortunately, some special treatment in my opinion. He'll probably be in solitary as well, as opposed to being in the general population and having to face the wrath of black um, folks who are incarcerated. Thank you for that conversation. I, um, you know, we only have about 15 minutes left together. This time always flies by so quickly. Um, I wonder if folks, if you all could comment a little bit on what are some of the specific things? We've had a lot of questions on this and we touched on it briefly earlier. Earlier, I told you I was gonna come back to, but what are some of the specific initiatives that you're supporting? Are there policy changes that have been proposed, whether at a city level, county level, or state level that you're supporting actions that people can take? Um, you know, we had a question about where can, you know, what, who can people follow? You know, a lot of folks have um, been following, you know, Mary or Nakima or LRC, you know, about how can we continue to make sure folks understand what's happening in our system. So um, if we could just talk a little bit about specific steps that people might take. Well, I'll just say real quick, I mean, we're still out there on the front lines. And that's been important for people to understand that we are thankful that a guilty verdict happened in this case, but we know that it's not the end of the story. So we're encouraging people don't get too comfortable. Remember, there are big picture systemic issues that we have to continue to address and they're far from being addressed. As you mentioned earlier, I think Sarah, when you were talking about the narrative of the one bad apple, um, in order to procure this guilty verdict. There's a lot of people who really do believe that. They think that Derek Chauvin is an anomaly as opposed to what happened in this case as far as him being able to take the life of a black man, even if it may have looked different than normal, he was still, um, he still felt comfortable doing it because of the culture of policing. So the Department of Justice is now conducting an investigation into Minneapolis Police Department. We asked them to do that years ago. I'm glad they're finally doing it, but it's not enough. We're asking that that be extended to all the metro area police departments. Um, we haven't received a response yet regarding that specific request. So if folks wanna lend their voice to that effort, you're more than welcome to join us. Um, there's the Minnesota, Co Co uh, Minnesota Justice Coalition, which I'm also a part of. We have eight bills pending at the legislature surrounding police accountability. Folks can go to mncoalition.org. That's mncoalition.org to see those bills. Um, and then just at the local level, we have to continue to push for changes to our hiring practices for who is even qualified to become an officer ensuring that cultural competency is a requirement. Some have asked for residency requirements. 92% of Minneapolis cops don't live in the city. None of the Brooklyn Center police officers live in the city of Brooklyn Center. So it is a widespread issue in terms of cops coming from the suburbs and exurbs, lily white communities, and then being able to patrol um, communities of color. And then of course, a more robust practice of disciplining officers. Um, Minneapolis has done a, a horrible job as far as um, um, disciplining of officers and creating a culture where they feel that they can literally get away with murder. So that's something we have to continue to um, use our voices to um, advocate for. You know, when you mentioned discipline, I think that's a huge thing. And I look, I think back to last summer when there was a squad car that drove downtown and indiscriminately started uh, pepper spraying people walking on the street. And, and that, that was a video that I'm sure everybody saw. And I, as part of the agreement with the Minnesota Department of Human Rights, the police department is supposed to put discipline on this list. And I, I look at that, which is 
you know, meaningless in, in, in terms of a lot of the things that have happened to people. But I think about something like that, which really has no defense whatsoever, and nothing has happened about it. And so I wonder, how could it take this long? Um, you got to know who it was that just pepper sprayed bystanders in downtown Minneapolis. There's no nothing that makes that right. Why? I mean, there's just this big gap into what is happening. Why is there a lack of accountability in in a, a much quicker manner? Um, because you really do need something to happen a little faster. So I, I think the accountability piece is huge, and that needs to be looked in. And I know the Department of Justice is looking into that as well. Yeah, I'll just piggyback off kind of what Mary just said just now with respect to accountability. We, I think one of the, the, the clear policy directives for me is that civilian oversight of law enforcement needs to actually be civilian oversight with bite and with power and with the ability to discipline. Um, and right now, there is a Minnesota state statute that basically says the opposite of that. It takes away by statute, the ability of any civilian oversight for law enforcement to actually have teeth, right? Um, and for me, when I look at concrete, like legislative tasks or things that we can ask for or, or advocate for, it's repealing something like that. It's repealing that statute and allowing, and then thinking about and reimagining what civilian oversight of law enforcement would look like. That's a short-term step for me because, as I mentioned earlier, I'm kind of a, I'm, a, I'm an abolitionist at heart, and so ideally we'd be moving away from law enforcement generally. But I think when we start talking about okay, what's a concrete task or ask that I can do now? For me, that's one of the major things. Coming from a community perspective, I put a, a link to the link tree on the chat with, we have a task force on qualified immunity because um, it's one of the 24 demands. And I think that's a, a way that folks can get involved in helping push um, ending qualified immunity forward. Um, I, but just a, from a very human level, um, I need folks to hold space in Brooklyn Center in front of that police uh, department I need folks uh, to hold space at George Floyd Square um, and in solidarity with pushing for justice. Um, we, the, these systems and city officials rely on protesters fatiguing out. They, they rely on people getting tired and forgetting that they were protesting and just going home. <laughs> they, they rely on that. Um, and so I think it's important for people in the community to be able to give people like Nakima a break and say, hey, sis, go home or take a weekend to rest, recover. I'll hold your space <laughs> like, and, and uh, allow you to rest so you can come back strong because the work that you do, Queen, is so, so, so important. Um, we need people to be able to do that. Um, another thing that you can do when you come to George Floyd Square, uh, the George Floyd Global Memorial, which is the organization that we created um, as a, a bridge between the family and community to be able to tell the story of the uprising and remember, because in, in the black culture, we've got this thing called the Sankofa bird. And it, it reminds us that we have to look back in order to know where we are going. And so this rememory experience that is just 200 of the 2000 pieces that we have preserved and conserved from the uprising last summer, um, it allows people to remember your protest. Cause so many people protested last summer and then we didn't see them for a minute. <laughs> but it, it, it reminds you of your protest and what you said and what the children said and what the elders said and what the postal workers said and, and the kind of justice that you were demanding. I think it's important for us to remember where we have been as a people, as a community and to allow that to push us and to drive us forward to continue to pursue racial justice. I can't tell you so many people who've come to me and said, Janelle, Thank you for caretaking at 38th in Chicago because that is where I come to be encouraged. That is where I come to be re-inspired. When I've nearly given up hope, I come and I hold space and just process. Um, and then I'm encouraged to keep going. I mean, I've heard that from 
um, activists, from lawyers, from photographers, from like, like people who are just deeply in the movement and throughout the Twin Cities, um, they come and they are reminded from the voices of your protests last summer. All we're doing is tending to it and making sure that the voices continue to be heard. But go and be reminded of the story that we created uh, as a community, as a city, if you live here in the Twin Cities. If you don't live here in the Twin Cities, um, I think they can, there can be spaces within your own community. Where have people protested? Where have people marched? Where is the story being held and kept? If that means you need to sit at the foot of an elder and just listen to the story to be re-inspired, or if you need to pick up a book, uh, read about the Montgomery bus boycott, or read about uh, somebody's protest to remind you where we've been, um, do that. So that way, um, so that way you could be encouraged and inspired to continue to march on, to continue to protest on, to continue to push for justice against the system that has denied justice for too many for too long. Thank you so, so much um, for this incredible conversation. Uh, you know, I think it's a it's a great place to end this this dialogue for tonight. Although it's certainly not the end of this conversation, uh, because we started by talking about the protests and the community demands for accountability that brought us to this place where we are now, where Derek Chauvin has been convicted on all counts, and where we are starting to have um, really uh, significant conversations around transformation, right? And how do we move from accountability for a single officer to transformation? And the commitment from the Legal Rights Center is that we will continue to be in this space and to continue to hold this space for these really important conversations. Um, we, you know, sentencing will take place in June and, um, you know, we, uh, but in the meantime, as folks are up in um, Brooklyn Center or, out um, holding space and other protests. We wanna remind you that we do have a Twin Cities legal support line that we operate in partnership with our colleagues over at National Lawyers Guild. Uh, the phone number for that is 612-444-2654. It's a way to get support for legal issues if you're out at a protest. We really encourage folks, if you're gonna go out, that you just take a Sharpie and write that phone number on yourself so that you have it if you do get arrested so that you can reach legal counsel. Um, and legal support. Um, and we're continuing to hold our community processing circles every Friday at four o'clock online. We're hoping with the weather changing um, that we might be able to start to hold some space outside. So watch for that. And I can promise you we'll be back with this space. Um, you know, we, we want to continue to hold, hold this space for this really important dialogue around what our community perspectives on justice. So thank you all. Can't thank our panelists enough for being here with us again this evening. Um, thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you all. <laughs>